the topic here today, uh, and this is the 31st of January, it's the 6th and for the moment final segment in a six month uh, oh, sort of series of talks, impromptu, very casual, some a little too casual for my taste. Uh, but anyway, I did my best. I'm not such a technician yet, maybe one day. Um, but in any case, I really appreciate the, the number of people that are striving and, and reaching sincerely from a deep place and an intellectual place and a heart place and a powerful place to make life better for themselves and their horses and people around them. Uh, the topic today is called Understanding the Lead Rope to Rain Connection from the Horse's Point of View. Now here you have uh, Molly and Bob. Here they are, Molly and Bob. They're going to be our workhorse team today for... I wish I had done this earlier with real horses or with these guys, but can't do it all every time. I haven't always had the best venues. I think one time it was raining and a couple of times it's been pretty compromised. If you'll pardon me for a minute, I have to get this stuff out of here. I don't quite know how to do it. How do you do it? Okay, I can't do it. Anyway, a lot of writing on here, but I'll just have to, I hope that, can you see these horses? That's what I don't know. I hope so. All right, so to help me explain uh, in a meaningful, succinct, I hope, not too long-winded, although I have to admit I am known for that. Um, I'd like to have a clear and concise way for people who are around young horses or have inherited older horses to really understand what goes into mixing a horse up and what goes into keeping him straight, thinking straight making good decisions for the two of you and also um, making good decisions for himself when he's not with you. In many situations people leave their horses in the care of others. I'm doing that right now myself. And in some barns I've been in, a horse may be handled by up to six or eight or seven, ten people a week that are not his owner or her owner. Anyway, all of this can be overcome and addressed in a, in a really easy way, a good way for the horse, if we can agree that their vision matters. Now, you wouldn't maybe know that because most draft horses and work horses and driving horses are, many race horses too, are historically used with blinders on to keep them from seeing things, which should tell you how important that is. Um, a horse really is a lot more comfortable when he can see and understand what's going on around them. It's some of the reasons that horses have such difficulty in trailers is that they hear things they can't see. Maybe bushes and trees and branches come on the side of a trailer. It's quite upsetting when you can't see what's making the noise that your instinct tells you to turn around quickly and look. But you might be tied up or in a stall or you can only see straight ahead. In any case, with your young horses, we're gonna explore the, here's your halter, and here's your lead rope. This is actually a Makati that I robbed off a bridle of mine when I gave my last lead rope away. I tend to do that a little more often than I should. All right, here we go. Now this here is going to presumably come down right about under the horse's chin. His nose, as all of you know, or many of you know, I'm not going to make assumptions. There could be people on here that have only had their first horse for a day, or maybe they're just planning to get one. So the nose goes th here. The bottom of the head is here, the skull. So he's not seeing this knot, but he's sure feeling it and its effects as it hangs here and as somebody brings it to one side or the other, or straight in front, or back over his neck on either side in any case. This is a pretty important tool, and it's going to be one of the earliest pieces of equipment that most horses will uh, have contact with. So it's important to understand its function, its limits, and its capacities. The real function is to help you get 
a horse from point A, I guess, or, or point B, uh, to point B, and um, to restrain him and prevent him from walking off if you need to. I guess that's about the main thing. I use it for many other things well before the horse is ready to ride, but we'll talk about that. If I don't run out of battery or some other thing doesn't happen, you never know. In any case, we're going to say that right here at the front of the face, I'm, I'm now right in between the eyes here, okay? So it's important to remember that when the ears come out here, my hand isn't big enough to do this, but you've got an ear here and an ear here, you'll see that his ears are kind of coming out the way my ears are coming out. My eyes go straight ahead and his are about here on the side. And when we get really connected to these horses um, in our routines or in our emotions or in our job, a lot of times we really only address the front of the face that's poking out of the stall or we go to the front of the horse or they come running up to us in a pasture or something like that. So we want to remember that, to be fair, they see on the side, right here, out the side, where our ears are, kind of. It's very important to them not to have their vision blocked. So a lot of the ways that people like to socialize and express affection to the horse and also like to discipline and control a horse is right here at the halter not sometimes people will grab the side of the halter which I don't recommend um, so much uh, it's better to hold onto a rope and perhaps put a little coil in here like this so that if the horse needs a little more room or you do you can drop a coil without dropping him so that's one thing you could do um, and but to really hold here and pull him around or feel that you're controlling him more uh, by being this close uh, actually puts you got to remember this is just an imaginary horse because the real horse if I'm holding him right here his chest is right here on my back and his neck the bottom of his neck is running up the back and his head's coming right over my shoulder here not the safest place to be with all horses particularly young ones or horses that are excited a uh, young horse on a windy day that you're leading down a road while the rest of his friends are galloping down the pasture. Well, you got to know a little bit about how to direct that energy. So I'm going to throw a couple of ideas your way about... I don't need to hold this anymore. Now you know what I'm talking about for the moment. Oh, before I put it down, let me suggest that we consider that from the horse's point of view, kind of anything to the... Uh, let's see, that would be your left. Anything to the left of center or to the right of center is going to begin to influence the way he starts to use his head and his pole, with the pole being the junction of his head to the top of his neck. So as he begins to, to tip that head in the direction that he feels and or sees this rope going, presumably you're leading him, either to your right or to your left, this is going to influence the way he is instinctively set up to want to move his hips all right so he's going to want kind of like a canoe he's if he, he wants to follow you with his head and neck his hips are apt to shift the other way assuming that there's room for him to do that so um you, you want to be mindful of this because this is a great opportunity for him to start to learn what your leading rein is all about okay so if this is your leading left rein um then you have a great opportunity before he's prepared to carry weight and good under saddle and understands how to be accountable to the equipment and to your expectations and your cues. You want him to benefit from the first year or two or three that you spend on the ground with him. And there's really no point in turning him into a um, punishable nuisance uh, over issues of affection and misunderstood proximity, misunderstood rewards and treats for oh, maybe the love you have for him or how beautiful he looks in that moment. Maybe maybe to reward him for coming in close and then jab him in the elbow for being there after he's been rewarded for crowding you might lead to the confusion about the purpose of this equipment because you pull him in to get close enough to tell him that you want to see him only to find out that you really don't want him there. And that kind of affects them the way it would anybody. All right, so just be careful about that one and perhaps start offering your affection back here where your saddle will go because really in the end, 
if you fall off, let's say you come shooting off this horse. I've done that uh, at least once. You go flying off this shoulder at 30 or 40 or maybe 10 miles an hour. It still feels terrible. Bam, down you go. So now he can either step on you, run home, or step aside and wait and just offer you that stirrup. Now that would be the best, I think. I, I, I used to, not recently, but I used to ride out a long way hours and hours out by myself and I always set those horses up so that when they were on their own to make their decisions for the two of us they generally hung out they grazed if there was something to eat and if they didn't have something to eat they'd wait and kind of bring me the side of themselves where a stirrup was very useful so here we have our team Molly and Ben I think oh Molly and Bob I think that was the name so they're looking at each other right here and both of them have an eye on the outside of the world, but presumably they're, if they're working in a team like most teams are set up, they're in a single harness here, but we're just going to use our imagination and say they're going in the same direction together. They don't really have to worry too much about what's in this eye and what's in this eye, because they know that this eye here is being covered by this eye here. They understand, okay? So this white horse is going to use the outside eye of the gray horse, and this gray horse will count on and, and rely on the instincts and the reactions of the white horse to tell him what's happening over here for her. Okay, that's how it works. Now, none of this is actually available to the horse as a tool for you if you express your and, and experience your relationship standing right there in his nose in front of him or putting him in cross ties and... A lot of kind of lovey-dovey stuff right there. Uh, I don't blame you for wanting to do it, but it does have repercussions and long-term consequences that usually lead to the horse being uh, confused or punished or uh, in some way uh, feeling the need to tune people out because there's not a lot of consistency about the way their faces are handled by everybody. And it's really... Uh, important if you're going to put the bottom half of yourself on the top half of a horse for him to feel not only good about what you're doing up there but to understand his job which is to take care of both of you when you can't make the decisions and to respond in a timely accurate safe and um, reflective manner. In other words, if you've got an intent that's coming through your body, your reins, perhaps your voice, your weight, your leg cues, your balance, your line of sight, all these things affect them very much. And if you're going to go to the trouble to have a nice clear presentation to one riding horse or to a team, whether you're on the ground, standing right in here or on anywhere on the side here, then you want to in an ideal situation, you'd like to have that horse reflect exactly what you're feeling, exactly when you're feeling it, and show you, because it's important for many reasons, um, that he understands what you want him to do with his feet. Okay, here's his feet, right there, four of them. Now, on most horses, it'll be about um, 16 square inches, or between 30 and 45 or 50 square centimeters, depending on what kind of a great big horse you're on or that you have in your halter. But either way, that's not much, that's not a very big platform when you're barreling down a field or going over a course of fences or through the woods. Um, here is your bridle. Now, the lead rope to rein connection, as you can see, is going to be maybe for some of you a bit of a stretch in comprehension, but I don't think so. I'll try to make it clear. I didn't have an English bridle at, but oh, I'll use this instead. Okay, this is, I start horses in this thing. This is better. It's a bit, okay, this is the best thing that ever came, I uh, ever figured out. Now, this is just a little, a little gag snaffle bit. I put a little chin strap on it here. And this is just a latigo saddle string from a Western saddle. Now look, I can put this on a workhorse. Look how big. Let's go from the top of my head halfway down to my knee. And then if I have a little tiny one, do like this. See, here's, that just goes right through this hole. See, like this. 
pull it like that. Now, the reason that I started using this is because it's pretty hard to convince uh, a youngster who's got teeth coming in and the constant need for oral gratification on his mother. She's got a little restaurant there for him. He follows her around, he pew, and he goes, has his lunch, comes back out, He's got milk mustache, looking his best, licking and chewing, and then there you are, and bop, bop, and bop, bop, and what do you taste like, and how's your face, and what does your hair feel like, and I've seen a lot of horses get disappointed when people slap them for that, or grab their cheek and pinch and poof, and punch them in the nose, and God, they're just trying to do what babies do. They're just reaching for a pacifier. They're reaching like a puppy will reach for another puppy's tail and a, a kitten will reach for his mother's tail and she's sitting there like this doing her tail and those kittens are... T -t 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 -t. It's just curiosity anyway. But the horses tend to scare people a little bit and they get a lot of misunderstandings about a horse's mouth. So I set this up and as soon as that foal feels like he has to bite me, I say, here, bite this. And then I set it low enough so that it's not up against his molars or bothering him and he can just chomp like this and he's just all go here all the time like this and then he can start to satisfy that urge and it's an instinctive thing it's totally normal should not be disciplined you should just work around it and set him up to succeed by uh, setting him up that you never have to train him how to put a bit on just have him bite on this one when he's little, he'll stop biting you. He'll stop looking for things to bite. He will start looking for this. I've done this for almost 15 years, so I'm sure of what I'm saying here. Now, the thing is, what do you do with this long piece hanging down? Well, I, I, we'll get to that later. Anyway, don't worry about it for right now. You, t What you do is you tie it up or you put a halter on over or you can run it around his neck or you can cut it off. If you just have a lot of babies and you're not working with big horses, you can just cut this thing off. And then what I do, uh, if I'm going to leave the foal with it on, I'll tie a knot so uh, I'll tie a knot above this so that he can't um, step on this string and hurt himself. I don't want to get too much into the technique of this, but let me just say for the purpose of this, we have a bridle, and for the purpose of this, we have our halter and our rope. So by the time your little horse has learned how to pack a bit and follow a lead rope, presumably you really wouldn't have to work too hard to think that this rein you'll eventually have on here going to his left is, is going to affect him visually and mentally and, and, and physically about the way your lead rope would start to support your intentions by directing the life in him where to go. All right, now, if you're not thinking about this from a rider's or ultimately a, you don't have to be a rider, you could just even if you were going to show the horse in halter or it doesn't matter. Maybe it's just somebody's horse that needed a home. It doesn't matter what you do with them, but it does matter that when you need to do something, you can. Um, and, and the basic thing would be, can I lead him here and can I tie him here? Can I put him where I want him and will he stay? If I have to hurry up a little bit, will he come? If I ask him to back out of the way, can he do that? These are just basic things. I want to remind some of you who are at more advanced levels of uh, skill, which there are certainly a lot of you out there because I've met a bunch of you and it's really fun, really, really fun to work with people that have <laughs> suffered through the basics and you realize you're never done with the basics because I have something to tell those of you just getting started. <laughs> You're never going to outrun the basics because that's all advanced work is. You just refine the basics and keep rolling until, until you and the horse are on the same page. Now, let's talk. I wish I had a hook here. Golly, I didn't plan this very well. Hang on, please. Maybe this will work. This is what I don't like about myself sometimes I don't plan this type of thing the best way all right here we go except it's not darn it okay here look I'm putting this on a bookshelf which I have god all right here we go all right here are my reins 
We're just going to call this for now some sort of horse. Just a minute. Okay, here we are. Now, here are my reins, okay? Oh boy, just a second. This is some horse. Okay, so now I have my reins. I'll try to see if it's in the camera. Okay, so here are my reins, okay? I've got my, I, uh, you're looking at this backwards. This would be my right rein, I think, my left rein. For me, it's the other way. But And this stuff that's hanging in here, forget that. I don't know how to get it. Just a second. Sorry, I didn't do my rehearsal very well for this. There was no time. I was trying to get a new furnace. Imagine that. Sunny Spain is a long way from here, I can tell you. Okay, there we go. So here are my reins. And what I have here, so some of you would be liking to see perhaps some leather reins or jumping reins or split reins. Doesn't matter. These are just, I braided this in the early 90s and it's just a rope. That's it. It's a closed rein. And just for the sake of you understanding why I'm doing this, I'll just say that when you have a closed rein on your Makati, M-E-C-A-T-E, Makate, not, um, it's, it's incorrectly referred to uh, in some parts of the world as a Makati, and that just, just isn't it. It's not a Makati, but you feel free to call it what you wish. But in any case, it's a closed rein, and when you want to go in one direction, it's good to have the extra in your outside hand, not on your inside of your turn, okay? Because if it's in your outside hand and you have to make a pretty severe turn, you can kind of drop this rein here down that shoulder groove. That's a bit generous, but anyway, you get the point. You can drop that down the shoulder groove and that will help the horse understand that he has just been released in the direction that he sees his eye, his eyes, oh boy, his eyes up here, but he sees your hand come out here, underneath his, his rein will come out underneath his chin, here on your bit, and he sees all that. See here, here's your horse, here's his eyes, you're sitting here, and these reins, now see I could have thrown it, I could use some dental floss for this. So here are your reins, I'm gonna make some reins right here. These are your reins, okay? So when you take a rein out here, that eye sees it. When you take a rein out here from where you sit, this eye sees it. So he wants to follow that. He can't if you don't release this very well. Get over here. Now you don't have to put a whole meter or two yards of line down there. And many of these reins are that you buy today are too darn short to release anything actually. But the point is, if you get your colt started right on the ground, and I'm gonna put this equipment away in a minute. It's kind of annoying. But I'm, I am going to try to show you that when you change directions, let's say I'm going to the left now, I'm going to look left first. There's a sequence to this, okay? First, you've got to go in your mind what you want to do. Then, it's a good thing if you look where you want to go because he'll feel that. You might still not have made the decision because maybe something over there, maybe there's some cows running out through a gate or somebody just knocked down a fence or a friend pulled up in the driveway. It doesn't matter what it is, but you could start there and then have to turn. So your body and the, and the way you direct your, your focus and your desire and your, the, the way the energy and the life comes up in you, he's going to feel that all the way down to his feet if you let him. Um, but what often happens is that a little bit of fear gets in there or a little bit of confusion or perhaps some balance that isn't quite right. And so people will start to do this and pull back or raise their arms up. And... Um, if you get off balance, uh, it's almost unavoidable to, to, to put too much pressure on the mouth and put too much pressure in your stirrups, leveraging the mouth against the pull on your feet. So you push forward with your feet, and you pull back, and you get your balance, and the horse says, oh, my word, what just happened? Well, what happened is about a, maybe 60 or 80 kilos just landed in your jaw, buddy, but didn't mean it. That's where you have to develop that relationship where he knows the difference between what you mean by what you do and what you don't really mean by what you do. And, and, and the older a horse gets and the more consistent you are, the less emotional you are about his mistakes and responses, the less correction you offer, and the more sureness you give him about what you mean by what you do, he will be able to cover for you when those mistakes happen. And he will. He'll do it 
happily. This I'm sure of. So now I'm going to take a right turn, and you'll see that I have the slack over here. Now, I wouldn't drop necessarily all that, but this is just to make the point, drop it. Okay, and you get that practice early on by having your lead rope available, coiled up to release to him also when he either needs to go away from you or you'd like him to go away, okay? So what you do with your lead rope from one, I can use this. Look at this. Here we are. Telephone cord. Here's your lead rope. From one degree, here, here's your lead rope coming out. From one degree to the right of center, and two degrees, or three, or four, or five, to the right of center, as this comes around, he begins to want to follow it. Now, I lunge horses, and I send horses around me quite differently from many people. I learned from Bill how to do it differently because he did it differently because he was on a chair and couldn't get up, or a bench. So I watched him with horses that were, at that time, uh, so, a couple of them, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I wouldn't have taken the lead rope, I certainly would have, but they were not right in the close range of my skill level at that point. And I watched Bill at 90, 89, 90, 91, taking hold of lead ropes that I would have to take a breath and kind of think before I did, to be honest. I mean, I have this more skill now and more practice, so I probably wouldn't hesitate a moment on those horses I'm thinking of. But at the time, and I was quite impressed and baffled that he could do all this sitting down and, and then later he explained it it's because of where he's looking where he directed core energy which was back behind the horse not at his body not at his ribs not at his shoulder certainly not at his eye and darn sure not in front of him he could get a horse on a 12 foot rope or a 60 foot riata to do literally anything he wanted with those feet at just about any speed. Some of them came in kind of high and kind of charging around and not under really much control at all, but of course they were because he never lost one that I saw. And he was just sitting there and he was quite old. But what he did was he managed them through a clear line of sight, directing core energy behind or on the side of their legs where they could feel it and want to look at what he was looking at. And then he'd drop a coil right off his hand like this well, just to, to make the point that, hey, I'm over here. He didn't pull them because, of course, that makes the front end heavy. You don't need a front end any heavier than he already is. That's heavy anyway. So when you take your lead rope, you want to have, or they'll just call this a lead rope. It's not, but we pretend it is. So you take your lead rope, and you want to keep the tail end of it right here where you got a hold of it so that if you have to drop it, you do. You will find, as you're learning how to do this um, over time, <laughs> you'll do this once in a while. Then well, you drop the whole mess at your feet, you step all over it, and your horse is still, and you're right in the neighborhood, too close for usefulness, and you let the wrong end of the rope go. So it's important if you're changing hands, changing sides on the horse, handing the rope underneath the neck to yourself over like this, that you remember when you do this here, see? That you catch it like this so that that's in your thumb even though the th poppers coming out the front it doesn't matter it's what does matter is that you don't hand yourself this and then drop the wrong end the horse needs that make sure it's not something you've set yourself up to trip over okay so i am going to put my glasses on and see if there is a question at the moment i have a pair of glasses that is crystal that is too strong for me and quite ugly and the other is about right and too big about the right so I'm going to put these on and see what's going on here uh, okay lots of people hi uh, are there any um, well what does it mean bring them on camera Joe Mitchell what do you mean are there any questions I wonder anybody where are the where are the, um, oh, I see, here we go. Let me just see. Uh, I don't understand what bring them on camera means. Aren't you, aren't you here? What is this? Why do horses lean? Oh, there's a question, okay. 
Uh, we can talk about that in a minute. What in the world is this bring them on camera? I mean, I just have no idea. Uh, okay, somebody already knows all this. That's great. Look, does anybody know what this means, bring them on camera? Are you guys there or are you not there? And do I still? Yes, I do have some lead ropes for sale. Yes, I do. Just write me a write me a note, or you'll find them on my website. Or or they're they're at the no, I guess they're not. Just write to me at Horse Gear H O R S E G E A R, or send me a, a WhatsApp or a message. Or yeah, I have them. I have them. So all right, now let me see. Why do horses lean? Uh, what else is there here? Ah, these glasses are too strong. These glasses are for somebody who can't see anything. Uh, do I like a bitless bridle? Not particularly. I don't, and I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, if you're going to ride in a bitless bridle, why don't you just ride in a rope and halter? I don't like a bitless bridle because there's no release in it. It tightens up and it encourages people to pull more than they might otherwise. I haven't seen any horse look as nice and as comfortable. I'm sorry I'm doing this, I'm just trying to see what it is that you guys are asking me here. Lovely to see all of you out there. I have had so much fun with my friends in the last month and a half. Cindy Newton, you rascal, you and your horses last weekend, I just had a ball. I hope they're doing better, and all right, hey Eugenio, okay you guys, no questions, huh? Okay, why do, yes, okay, here's a question, horsegear at lesliedesmond.com. You can write to me there, and I'll send you whatever you want. There are ropes and right tied halters, that's all I make. If you guys come up with your own right tied halter, please don't turn these big bulky horse halters inside out. They just don't have the right... You're welcome to. I'm not trying to sell you a halter. Go, You can build your own. But just turning a great big bulky left tied halter around to save 30 40 bucks, I, it, it's just not as clean a feel for the horse. It's just a... It's like putting your pants on inside out. You know, it's terrible. Why do horses lean? Great question. Can you give me a second? I'm going to give you the wise guy answer. They lean because there's someone to lean on. They can't lean on you if you're not in the way. That's that's the wise guy answer. Um, unfortunately, they are taught to lean. I've had many people say that, oh, my Mustang leans. Oh, this one leans. Oh, that one leans. Well, you know, I've had so many, many, many horses handed to me that lean. and I'm just going to tell you they've never leaned on me because I don't stay there. I, I move. And then the question inevitably comes up, well, if you're moving, isn't he winning? No, because there's no contest about leaning and winning and losing. I don't want him to experience how strong I'm not, you see. I want him to be as in awe of me as a two-legged person who can remove their hat and remove their jacket, which looks and smells just like a human being. We are the only thing they know that can take half of themselves off, put it down, it looks just like us, it smells like us, it's suddenly inert, lying there, and we walk off. Just like a snake shedding its skin in a way. Um, I just, I love seeing a group of colts jump back when a guy takes his cap off and, wow, did you see that? He took his head off. You know. You want to leave that awe, you want to leave that wonder, that sense of curiosity and amazement in them, and then they're much more interested in what you're doing. They want to know a lot more about who you are and why you do what you do and how they fit into it and can they fit into it and what are you doing. I mean, just go and muck a paddock full of horses and half of them will, well, they'll help you tip it over, they'll help you move your fork and your rake, but that's not to be a nuisance, it's because they've got enthusiasm for things that are moving and things that are new, things that smell and look differently. I mean, they're so alive inside and 
and and it's it's such a world they have in there to share with us if we could only um, appreciate it instead of having to feel the need to shut them off at every just like a leaky faucet you know shut that thing down it's it's really um, you can shut them down to a point where they never come back to you which is the sad part many of the horses I work with are at that spot Cindy Newton's are not I should say not so if you have a horse that is taking a treat out of your hand, whoever, who said this here, is learning related. Why don't I have any connections to this? I'm trying to see what these questions are. Feel free to put them in a comment somehow because I really don't, I see some attempts to get a, a question over there. It's coming in just two or three words at a time in blue. I don't know why. But I'm going to go on this leaning thing. If they come in to you and you receive them, if you feed them by hand and back away while you're getting another one out or you reach over here and you're getting another apple and you back up a little bit and put your hand out, they're having the experience of moving you and being rewarded for doing it, you see. So then you get your back on the wall or you suddenly find that you're in about four or five other horses behind you and you say, wow, hey, come on back in here, go get out of here and then you start pushing and you're gonna unfortunately this is what is really the pity um, I got a fork here I can use to show you most of the people are gonna start to push on that horse right about there right about at that shoulder or that neck right here I got my fork right there or right there or they're gonna go bad boy and then he's going to say, oh, I'm a bad boy, but boy, that apple was really good. And if you're not all worked up and in some frenzy of fear or rage, they'll think that that little bad boy thing is just kind of a something you're doing to make yourself feel better while they move in and get another carrot out of you, which is what most of them will do. But they can't do it if you don't participate at that very, very instructive level of double standard and double crossing them by the way that is a double crossing deal to tell them to come in and reward them for crowding you and then tell them not to lean on you as you push them because this is what the lesson is the lesson becomes the pushing so what they learn is how strong you're not that's what they learn and then they learn in one way that you're not sincere either. That's not to say that you're a liar, but they keep track of, they keep score, they keep track. It's not, not in a bad way, but they remember. They've got great memories, and they remember, they remember movement. They remember sight. They remember sound. They remember energetic shifts as your emotions change on the telephone, as your emotions change as a student as a child, as a parent. They remember and feel all this influence. And that's why really they're here anyway today is because by responding to these things before there were barns and fences and corrals and halters and lead ropes and chains and buckets, they were running. They'd run to see what was going on. They'd run away if they didn't understand it or didn't like it, and then they'd sneak back and have another look. I mean, if you give a horse a couple of minutes, he'll go and check out something with his mouth and his feet, for heaven's sakes. But if you're telling him he has to do it or dragging him into it against his wishes, because you see, when you drag them, it actually pulls the weight right onto the forehand that you need light at that moment. That's the point. So you really want to try to direct the energy as it comes up instead of correct, correct the behavior that you don't want. And that means that you let the horse flow with you, okay? He's going to come in with his view of the world and his view of you and his operations with himself. Many of them are young. They have no idea what's expected. They're just enjoying the feel of the day, the wind in their hair, their mane flying around looking at other horses, trying to make sense of you and your equipment, or you and your fear, or you and your affection, whatever it could be that day. And as they seek to see where they fit, 
in an experience that involves you, I think most people get in trouble when they have a reactive instead of a proactive way. You want to think about where you want those feet. Where do you want his feet? Because once you're clear about that, then you're clear where to put your feet. And when he knows where you, your feet are going to be, there's very little that you have to do to move him that, that would involve his head. And that's the thing. So if you don't want the horse to lean on you, I would suggest you don't lean on him. And if he already leans on you, and you don't know how to break the habit, you're going to start standing back here more. Start grooming his tail first. Start grooming his butt first. Scratch him under his belly. Clean his back feet first instead of his front feet. Leave the treats out. Put the treats in a bucket instead of in his mouth. And then bam, bam, bad boy for crowding. Okay? So I think that'll take care of the leaning. Uh, now, I see some more... This is really ridiculous. Just a second. What about asking what? I don't know how to find the rest of this. What about asking what? I don't see. Is leaning related to cutting in during groundwork and lunging? Leela Olson. Okay, good question. Is leaning related to cutting in during groundwork and lunging? I guess in one way it depends, but uh, yes, on the Sandy McDonald, yes, horse gear at lesliedesmond.com. I'm going to take Leela Olson's question right there. Um, here we go. Yes. Is leaning related to cutting in during groundwork and lunging? In my experience, Leela, the cutting in during groundwork and lunging comes primarily from the uh, very uh, popular and um, most common habit of looking the horse right in the eye when you lunge him, or slightly ahead of him, or certainly no farther back than the elbow, and um, using a whip to keep him out, directed toward the forehand, directed toward the ribs. That will cause a horse to bend away from you, pull the lead rope straight instead of bring you the it's harder when he's being pushed at the head and face for him to stay round in your direction and have, let's say, from a bird's eye view, have his spine take the shape of the circle on which his feet are traveling. You want him to go around you, left or right, then it's important to allow that by functioning as the center of the, the hub of the bicycle tire and let him go around on this. Mostly what I see is that people are going this way on the circle with their horse. They're walking the same circle. They'll start walking as fast as they want that horse to go. And as soon as he goes, they kind of overtake him and sort of almost chase him in a circle. So he's really leading you at an oblique angle as you kind of follow him quickly around. I wouldn't do that. I would have my core from my belly right down to my feet, right down the front of you. Have that go behind him about six feet two meters, three meters, depending on the sensitivity of the horse, but to actually direct your focus on his body, which I, I do know a lot of people recommend that, but when I see the results from that that are the results I want, I'll probably do a little more of it. But right now, what I, what I get handed to me are horses that are quite counterbent, quite unclear about how to even get the forehand on the outside of, an, of, of a circle, and most of them are just quite content to spin around while the person runs toward toward them, trying to get them out and a lot of action toward the head and neck and I don't know, a lot of confusion in that. And and I, I just I'm just really sure that there's a better way. And I and I'm trying to show it every day. I'm trying to show it every day. And I try to have my friends and my students and my customers and my teachers and everybody I can think of try to show it because once you figure it out that you can just release that horse to go, wow, what a difference it makes. It's something so beautiful. And uh, it's also very relaxing when a horse is clear that he's the other end of your thoughts. Yeah, it's really nice. And he's the other end of your thoughts. And that just is such a seamless and beautiful way 
when he's the other end of your thought, for you to just climb up and say, take me home. Take me over there. You look, you open a toe with the elbow, you release a little of that outside rain, bam, that shoulder's just going to take you off. It's no more of this business of, look at, let me see if I can do this now. All right, well, I'll try to do it with Molly here. I don't know if I can get this phone cord and this little metal horse to do it for me, but let's say that I'm riding this little metal horse. Gee whiz. All right, I'm kind of doing it like this. Well, we'll just pretend that it's in her mouth, okay? So I want to go over here to the right. I'm on this horse. If I got my left rein here and I start pulling this rein back, see, pull. She doesn't see that. Now she sees it. She may see it, but this right, this left rein over here is still tight. You have to kind of give her, you want to give on one side, you guys. You're going to have one hand go forward and the other hand go out on your green horses. Help them. They have to see. Let them use their eyes. Let them use their neck. They've got a neck that's about between the center of their ears and the root of their neck, which is down in here between these shoulder blades. They have seven cervical vertebrae. Seven cervical vertebrae. And the last couple of ones are kind of inside all this huge housing of muscle and bone and sinew and protective protective front end of the horse is going to, that neck is buried right down in there. There's your sternum. I think this is my sternum. No, sternum's down here. What am I thinking? That's my throat. I'm not a doctor. Um, I know the horse's sternum, though. Um, right up in here, you have the sternum. And at that sternum, where that neck connects, you have tremendous flexibility. And what I am just absolutely amazed is how many people will take that horse and just tie him straight back and pull hard and telescope that neck down and in for what ungodly reason I still don't understand how it's supposed to lead to anything light and beautiful because I've never seen it work. I've seen short-term results with control and submission and the horse will believe that you've dominated him because in fact you have but boy there's just nothing too pretty that comes out of that because the horse can't understand how to swallow his own neck back into his body and still make a turn when he's asked. So they get stuck and they end up getting quite heavy and what a lot of these early situations that are not clear end up producing is a horse that learns to walk toe first, heavily in front, reluctant to make an impulsive start, reluctant to believe you on the first try, and heavy in front. You'll see it with those shiny feet where they land toe first. You'll see it on the shoes that are worn off at the toe. And you'll see it on the horses that have got their heels up in the air in the sand and they only see like a half a moon where a horse is, a shod horse is walking in a sand arena. You never see the heel step. And a lot of this is training. It's not genetics. It's not your farrier. Can be both, but usually not. Usually not genetics. Very, very rarely actually, I think. But it's, it's the use, it's the expectation, and it's where you release them. So we want to talk about the idea that you release or that you suggest to a horse that he has, um, he has your, you, you're allowing him, you're inviting him to do something, you're allowing him to do it once he says, yes, okay. He might salute and say, yes, okay, and then doubt that he really can, or he might just say, wow, look out, here I come. Pew! And both of those replies are great because it's, he understood. The delivery might not be what you want, but as long as there's a try and as long as he's not whipping around and kicking you in the head, you're ahead of the game. If you ask for the forehand and he's trying to arrange himself to give you the front end with a heel first landing using his foot in a way that will support and balance himself as he tries to follow the suggestion from you on a rope like this, not this, okay? This is gonna make the front end heavy. When you pull on his head this way, those feet are going to get heavy. That's if, you're, it's, that's if it's a bit. That's if it's a lead rope. Because you're pulling the head and neck over a leading foot. That puts the weight there. Okay, So you want to try to think about how to not have that be the lesson. Okay, 
And then maybe there'll be less leaning, less confusion, less running off, less bucking, less loss of a diagonal, better lead changes. All right, I'm going to put my glasses on and put you right up close and personal so I can see what in the world is being written here. Okay. Now, I'm going to go through these. I just don't understand these crazy things that it says here. Leslie. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Jess. Okay, let's see here. Any more questions, you guys? I mean, I'm just reading through your things here. Yes, ropes are for sale. Halters are for sale. You'll find them on my website or at, um, just write to me. I'll tell you what's in stock. It's on, oh, I know where it is. I even put a Facebook page up. Desmond, yeah. What am I thinking? Desmond Outfitter, for heaven's sakes, on Facebook. It has everything listed there. Desmond Outfitter. I'm not such a, um, I'm not catching up on all the details in my, business life at the moment. Too much traveling. Hi from Cornwall. Hey, Katrine. Hi. A lot of people here. Wow, the whole world is over in here. A lot of countries. Just hang on. I'm getting to your questions. Excuse me. I'm waiting for some questions. Hey, Maurizio. Missed you when I was over there in your country recently. Maybe I'll see you next trip. Okay, now, uh, is there another question? Because what we need to do is to make sure that I'm not skipping over anything that you would find valuable, okay? I would like very much, um, at the moment, to see if we could switch gears a little bit, because I can't see any more questions in there. Um, I'm open, ready and waiting if you want to write some. They seem to come up whenever they do. I don't know, just a second. Uh, let's talk about the horses that do not stand squarely, if we could, for a moment. Because this has a lot to do with your groundwork and how you set them up on your lead rope to be ready to ride. Okay, I'm, I'm shifting a bit. Now, because this is really important, uh, let me just see if I have another. Yeah, I have a big horse here. Hang on. Just a minute. I have this one. Okay. This is good. Here's a big one. Look at this. This horse has pretty well balanced three feet. Okay, he's carved wood horse, but here he is. Um, we have uh, a hind quarters right underneath, a leg at each corner. We have a four front hoof on the ground, and as it always seems, they seem to like to lift up that left front leg, no matter what century, what country. This is Chinese. This is German. German little metal horse. Let me see. I think I have one more. I'm gonna might be a little more manageable. Hold on. Got one more here. Okay, this is a little more like it. This horse has his right front foot up, and he is uh, going somewhere, not very fast. But this is the point. The placement of these feet. I want you to look at this, and I want you to really start looking at the way your animal is using himself, okay? When you have him tied to the trailer, are his back feet close together like this? Are his back feet this way, one behind the other? Are his feet pointing out like this? Are his hocks touching? Is he standing on one foot? Has he got his right hip back? This is really important to pay attention to. Here's another horse, just a minute. Uh, this is a falconer. Okay, so here's another one. All of these horses that I've shown you here, because they're sculptures and renditions of horses, they're pretty well balanced. They have to be, otherwise they wouldn't be sold as sculptures. But anyway, they come from life, hopefully. 
and in all of these cases you really do see a leg at each corner okay here you have a hip you have a stifle here it's a rodea or knee you have a hock you have a fetlock you have a pastern you have the whole setup okay and and you can also get this app I'd like you to get this app it's called equine 3d no sorry equine anatomy 3d nine bucks it's on iTunes get it on your phone it's an absolutely invaluable very cool tool so here's this hindquarters I'll use this one because it's nice and big you can see here that this the hocks on this horse are a little bit tipped in you'll see it everywhere it's quite normal doesn't mean desirable but it is normal it comes from many things and I'm in discussion right now with people in a couple of different countries and in several different places in the states about the fact that their horses are not in good alignment they have a hip that's out here maybe 27 to 33 inches wide on some of these horses huge and then they have their hocks are almost touching and then by the time they get down there the hooves are right behind each other like this what kind of foundation is that you got to think about that why is that horse tucked in like this with as much as he weighs he's got hips here you wouldn't be in a house like that so you want these shoulders the knees come down you want these hips you got your stifles many of these stifles are poking out your knees on your horses are loose they're weak the hocks are inside and then on many of these horses as they walk away from you you'll see you'll see on the um, on the right hind you'll see a counterclockwise turn so that the foot will step down and you'll see that that hock will turn on the left side the hoof, the hoof will step down and the hock will turn they'll twist and, and they do that because for many reasons which I'll get to in a minute they'll land on a part of their they'll land on the outside of the hoof and then to push off they they tip their foot the other way so they can push off as close to center so the breakover is where nature intended they try that but what actually is happening is that every time you'll notice this if you're behind horses on trail rides you'll notice this in the dressage world the cutting world the jumping world the recreational backyard Jim can a horse world all over the place these horses are living in the bodies that our domestic environment that is established for their care creates most horses don't get enough exercise they really don't and what happens is when we exercise them intermittently and we feed them up so that their jaws don't function properly that the the arcades the upper and lower arcade don't work properly the incisors are not used in their proper function and in many cases you'll see that the the very well-intended vets and dentists who are out there trying their best a lot of them forget the incisors and or don't think it's necessary and so over time you get eight or ten years of the horse just having his molars done and these teeth just start to fold over each other and chip off and get in the way or they'll start to work their own teeth on the bars uh, many many times there's a little more information um, uh, is needed and and not available sometimes at the right time um, and I'm not saying that you know a mouth that is out of occlusion is going to create a back end that is wobbly or uh, unstable but it happens because once the mouth isn't working right and the TMJ and the pole don't work right that affects many things all the way down and mainly in the diaphragm I am not a you know registered anybody in this I just want to let you know I'm no doctor I'm not a vet I don't have you know any sort of fancy credentials in all of this but I do pay attention I listen to people I watch horses and I see uh, I just seem to see quite a bit that maybe just the circles I travel in I, I learn a lot I learn as I go I try to remember everything I see and I try to put it together it's a big puzzle isn't it uh, the way these horses work and what various disciplines um, experts of, of, of many different um, 
uh, many different specialties and, and um, really advanced knowledge of uh, physiology and biomechanics and um, nerve pathways and muscle, healthy muscles and unhealthy muscles and nutrition related things. It's, um, it's fascinating and, and inspiring how many people are out there working hard to, to really do their part and, and, and to contribute. I'm, I'm lucky that I see and get to know so many people with these very specific specialties. I, I have not mastered any of them, but I take what I can and it starts to make a picture that, that starts to fill in like a big puzzle with a little more pieces coming. So what I want to say about these narrow hips is, and these, and these wobbly, insecure, unstable stifles, always going to have an unstable hock and always going to have an unstable stifle and an unstable hock on a narrowly based hind end because the weaker those joints are, the more they need each other in a sort of triangular pattern with the front end out and the back end here. There is something to do about it, not to be uh, dismayed or in any way feel discouraged, um, but a lot of it can be helped just by letting the horse move more uh, letting him run with others, have time on his own, um, without the confinement. I know it's really convenient to have a clean horse and a, and a, and a well, a well kept, a quickly presentable horse for a lesson or a show or something. But actually, it's probably not as good for them as being outside and being able to roll and lie down and run and mess around with their friends um, as much as they would like to. Certainly very few of us are able nowadays to keep horses in in living situations that we would consider ideal but we can keep trying and we can get to the barn more often or we can have someone exercise the horse for us all these small things go a long way toward um, having the horse be uh, full of himself and ready to be full of you when you arrive and embrace you and your short time you might have for him and just make the most of it because he feels better. Now, I'm not sure what else I can say at the moment. Um, I have so many things on my mind. I'll just don't want to overload you with these things, but I will say that your handling of that rope and that horse on the ground, um, let me see. I just can't get over this stupid message. It says, bring them on camera. If you guys can't see this, why can I see your names then? I don't get it. I just don't get it. Okay. So here's what I'm wondering. There's one more thing now. Let's let's take let's take the idea that you've got a, 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 a oh good lord. Let's give the idea now that we have a real urgency to get somewhere, go on a show, get to the lesson on time. We don't have the right tack. Darn it all. And we, we know that the saddle fits us. We're not sure it fits them. And we're just going to stick it on there and go. Now, in a limited way, I'm sure that that's okay. I'm sure they can accommodate that. But darn it all, I saw a horse the other day in a picture. And his front feet, he's standing this way. Okay, he's, he's, he's out here. Very, very, very far apart. His shoulders are just tiny, tiny. And the front feet are about a meter apart. The back feet are here. So to me, when I see that, I see a horse that's trying to get tiny. He's trying to get away. He's trying to get up inside. Well, as it turns out, I think it's quite likely that that saddle doesn't fit very well because as you try, it's important to understand that that shoulder blade is very much like the way an old propeller from an airplane is say from the 30s, I think. A piece of wood with a little rim on it. I think it was either aluminum or nickel or stainless steel. They used to screw that on to the edge and it would be a nice rim and that way the, the propeller could just stay intact and round and if it hit something, probably a bird or a branch, that would not gonna wreck your plane. Well, the way God set the horse up, he's got one of those too, except it's cartilage on the top of the shoulder blade now, the more you jam those shoulder blades inside the gullet, the fork of the saddle, the Western saddle or English that doesn't really fit, 
the narrower that gullet is, the more that horse wants to fold his shoulder blades together. Mind you, here's this wither coming up. Okay, there's the wither, sort of. Shoulder blade that's like, that should come up. Let's see how I do it. This way, and make this shape, you know. Here's your shoulder blade. Here's your wither. Here's your other shoulder blade, like this. Okay, well, these saddles that come down, plop, and the shoulders want to peek in there and not get that cartilage rubbed off. It's quite painful. Now what happens is that that shoulder blade starts to push those elbows out and that shoulder joint there at the top of the forearm gets wider and the feet go down, the feet get wider, so you've got this tiny little shoulder up in there. There's, on some of these horses, particularly ones that are only mounted on one side, you'll see a, sometimes a very intact shoulder blade this way and one like this. So I'm going to suggest that on your horses that you think might not be traveling in a good way, <clears throat> go up to their butt. Let's see if I got here. Look, right here. See this guy? You're going to go up and you're going to stand right here. You're going to put your chest right there. Don't worry, he won't kick you. Or well, maybe he will, but probably he won't. I shouldn't say that. I don't know your horse. He better not. So you stand with your feet right here, right there, and you're going to be here, and you're going to look right down that back. Okay? Not when he's trotting, obviously. This horse seems to be moving out. And you're going to see whether these shoulder blades that you see when you look down here, you're going to see whether these are even. Many of them you'll see look kind of normal on the right and kind of flat and messed up, or not even there on the left. Now what ends up happening when we misuse our gear to get on a horse, we'll pull our weight. We'll put that foot in, load that stirrup, and boom, pull the hair. Don't do that. Uh, pull your saddle horn, pull your saddle, like leverage yourself up. Get fit. Don't do that. Get yourself strong, get your abs going, get your legs right, get a bounce in your foot, and up you go. Nothing worse than putting someone on a horse that can't jump, my God. Okay, so you want to get some fitness in you if you're going to get up there. It's a very good idea. Or if you can't get fit or you're recovering from an injury, that's okay. You use a step, okay? You get a, a stair or you teach your horse to come and pick you up off the fence. That's also advisable. But in either case, you're going to stand here and you're going to look down. With, you can put your hands on either side of his butt right here. And you're going to look right down and you see for yourself what that horse's life and his use has created in that back, okay, from a standstill. I will suggest that if you do this when he's in a cross tie, cross tie, two ties here, one on either side, try to have it long enough so that he can drop the back of his head right here, his pole, down about level with his withers if he wants to, okay. Don't have these horses tied up here if you don't mind because you don't want to have such a strain on the back and on the croup and on his piriformis muscles. When you tie them high and they're arched, they're kind of forced arched, you don't really see what you want to be seeing. You see something different. You see what he has to show you, not what he can show you and that would be really the place to work from when he's relaxed and he can let his lungs expand and just relax his top line. You want to see him just as he is. The common thing that you're going to see on these horses is that there's no muscle right here. Right behind this shoulder blade there's very little muscle. And the back pulls away from the impact of the rider. The back pulls away. So you want to you want to learn how to work the abs and you want to go in. Let me get my fork again. You want to go in right here on the inside of these thighs. I'll get a bigger horse, just a minute. That's kind of ridiculous. Here you go. You want to go in here, right in here, on the inside. And you want to, you want to start to find where these ligaments coming down out of the groin are too tight. And they're really, really tight. They're so tight that they feel like they're metal or they feel like they're made of cables or wire. You start working these. On these horses that are too upset to stand still when you get on, they're too upset to stand 
for grooming, you'll find that many of them are so tight in here that when you tie their heads in a cross tie this high, instead of letting them be a little lower like that, or even lower, but when you tie them and their heads have to be sort of up in here, this is exaggerated, not that high. Let me find one here like this. Okay, and you tie them up like that, and at a standstill, their heads are there. It doesn't give you an accurate read on some of their body conditions. So I just wish I could put all this in very, chunk it down into well-organized, clear thoughts, because I have, in my mind, they're well-organized, clear thoughts. It's just this format might not be the best. I'm working on it. Um, I do have a lot of, um, I have a lot of media I've been making and collecting that I'm, I'm uh, just trying to get a point to a point where I can prepare it and present it in a, in a way that's possible to study. This is a little bit disjointed and, you know, I, I started here talking about the lead rope to rein connection from the horse's point of view and I'm going to get back to that now for a minute. I've taken a few side trips. Um, your lead rope, uh, I want to mention, should be long enough uh, so that you don't liven up a horse into a rope that is too short. One of the reasons that horses like to stop and turn and face you is that they learn over time that you really don't mean it. When you liven up and send them out, they hit the end of that rope, spin around, they load the forehand, and all of that feels correct because they're following the feel of the limits of the equipment you're using. And also those limits are influenced by your line of sight, your emotions, whether you're holding your breath and whether you're pulling or, or allowing that horse to place himself in a way that would um, favor his instincts, his instincts being um, the ones I'm thinking of, is to be ready, to be balanced, uh, to be curious, to be willing. Those are all very natural things that a horse has in him to share with you. And it's really a little bit sad for me to run into so many horses that have had all that try and life and potential kind of systematically shut down and ground off and said no to only to find that after someone gets a little more confidence and skill they have to go digging and try to find it inside that same horse and it's very often not there anymore. So I will say, and Buck Brenneman helped me a lot in one way by encouraging me not to retrain for the fifth time an old horse I'd had. He said, you know Leslie, don't break his heart and tell him that everything he learned for you the last time isn't what you want now. Boy, that hit me hard. He said, just work with a younger horse. Go get a fresh canvas. Go get a new, go get a new horse to work with. There are plenty of horses in the neighborhood that could use some help. So I'll say that to all of you with your horse that you, you know, when you learn something new or you find a new uh, teacher or a new uh, colleague or a video you want to admire and copy after, it doesn't have to be that it means everything you did before is wrong. Hang on a minute. There. Oh, that doesn't look good. Oh, I can't help it. I can't see. Um, so you, you, you want to just, you want to be happy at the point where you've brought your horse, okay? Just be happy with the effort that he's given you and the, the try that he can express to you in a very personal way. I will try to figure out what you mean. That, he could have, you could have been the fifth person that had him do the same thing a different way. And he's still got that willingness to say, hey, how can I help? I, I'm here to help and I've been standing around waiting for somebody for a few hours or a few days or maybe a few weeks, some of these horses. In my case, they wait a year for me to come home. But they're not in a stall, that I, that I will say. Um, but in any case, when you have that life still there and you can see it's like a new shoot, a new... Um, it's like a new leaf on a, on, a, on, a, on a branch or on a fruit tree. You want to see that life coming through. Uh, try not to have bad boy in your mind or don't do that in your mind or hey, hey, and, and the quick things. And I, uh, I want to really encourage you. I'm going to show you something here now. Something just occurred to me to do before I end this. Maybe I'm 
God, I hope I have not run my battery out. This could happen too. Oh boy, won't be the first time. Just a minute. I'm gonna make this thing, just a second. <clears throat> this is another halter that someone made for me, Tori Seavey. Thank you, Tori. Tori made these for me, look at this thing. Great little setup she gave me. My halters all tie on the right, because I have found that any tack shop in the world will give you one that ties on the left. But anyway, so you have your horse here, and I'm just gonna suggest that those of you who do this and have this automatic thing that you do all the time, just remember that's somebody's head. Just remember that. Because if you do it when you're riding on the ground, you will also do it without meaning to, unconsciously probably, when you're riding. Now, another thing, a pet peeve of mine, I have a, I have a, um, a, a three-piece bit here. You can use whatever bit you want. But the ones that split right in the middle, they're just two pieces. Would you please not hold this horse here and let that thing split in half? Wait a minute, where's my other one? Would you please not do this? Please not stick that up in his mouth like that by holding two reins underneath his chin. Okay, because then his head has to go up. He's trying to... He's trying to get away from that one, all right? So if you're gonna hold your horse by the bridle, and there's nothing wrong with that, just take him on one side or take the reins over the neck. It's very little extra trouble and it makes his day a lot nicer. So there's nothing wrong with having a bit like that. But just pick one side to be on, allow him to do some following because that's actually what leading is. And then, uh, then I would suggest that you film yourself from time to time more often than not so that you can please film yourself and have a good look at it. You can have a good cry, you can have a good laugh, you can have your friends over and pick each other apart. Just start really being honest with yourself about, um, about the steps that you can take to flatter your horse and to flatter yourself by being humble with your mistakes. It's, you have nothing to prove, really, in, unless you do. But I think the faster we can come to a point where we are not critical of ourselves, we will stop being unnecessarily harsh with our horses because when you're critical of yourself and you don't see and credit your own self with try and effort, very hard to see that try that the horse is offering. Okay, I think I'm going to pick this up again you know what's going to happen in 48 hours, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say, I should have said this. So maybe I'll do it. Um, and maybe I won't. I think, though, that I, the sun is going down here and I have quite a bit to do. So for now, maybe that's enough. I really want to thank you for your joining me here today. And I know we talked about many things that were related in a tangential way to the lead rope and rain connection. But I, I want for the future discussions, you to start thinking about getting these horses aligned, seeing how your shoulders are balanced, getting comfortable, putting your arm and your hand in here, helping these horses with these very important muscles. Look, you've got these muscles. This is what you climb stairs with and what you ride with. Help them with their muscles, especially these horses that are inside all the time. Try to get yourself a leg at each corner. See this guy here? He's got a leg at each corner. When you see the horses going like this, as they come to you in the back, and they, and they step this way around, and they make sort of a, I don't ride that kind. I don't mind if you do, but I would prefer, if you see that, that you start to really think about why that happens. Most of them are not born that way. I I know people that don't agree with that, but I look at a lot of horses and I see them change often quickly from various types of unconscious neglect. So that doesn't mean that anyone is guilty or that anyone means to, but there's just too much to know for everybody to get it all 
on the first time with the first horse. So don't beat yourself up if you've made some errors. Just get out there and try to add to your knowledge. Uh, that app I told you about, Equine Anatomy 3D, I think that will be helpful. And I'll see you later. All right, thanks.